And that's the other side of this. Because, Peter, I think back to Carson Palmer and the Bengals in 2011. Or the possibility oh, yeah. of which you and I are both very familiar of Joe Burrow not going to the Bengals two years ago. And Bengals fans, he, we know he went there and we love Joe Burrow. But the reality is there was at least the possibility entertained of not going to Cincinnati. It did at least happen. And as I mentioned in Playmakers, and as someone close to the situation told me, if he had been from Athens, Georgia, and not Athens, Ohio, he wouldn't have gone to the Bengals. But but the Cardinals, I think, are the one team that would be the closest in mindset and approach to Mike Brown, and the attitude would be, sorry, we got your rights this year and next year, because surely they'll pick up the fifth-year option. So you play for us or you play for no one. So if you want to play football, you play football for us. We're not going to trade you. We're not taking the calls. If, if anyone who calls us mentions the word Kyler at any point in the conversation, we're going to hang up. We're not trading you. You can't make us trade you. Oh, I know the age of player empowerment has arrived, and it's more like the NBA. Not in Arizona. Nope. We're not going to do it. If they take that approach, he's stuck, Peter. He's stuck. Then you ask yourself, if you're Kyler Murray, how important is $5.5 million to me? That's, that's what you ask yourself. And if you're the Arizona Cardinals, you say, hmm, we drafted Kyler Murray coming off a three-win season in 2018. We were bereft of hope. We did not trust uh, our quarterback at all. We knew we needed a quarterback. And so, you know, what happened this past year? Now, they got a little bit of an assist from Colt McCoy winning two games. But what happened last year? What happened is that the Arizona Cardinals won 11 games. So they've gone from three wins pre-Kyler to 11 wins in the year that Kyler midway through the season was a legitimate uh, MVP candidate. And, you know, you can't invent that, oh, we'll be fine without Kyler. You just, you, you, you can't do that because they won't be fine without Kyler. And so I look at this, Mike, and I think that Kyler Murray and Eric Burkhart have a little bit of power in this case because the one thing that the Arizona Cardinals do is that they're going to get fans to come to their games. But the minute that the fans perceive that they're trying to take shortcuts or they're not all in it to win, everything like that, what happens to the big red sea out in the Valley of the Sun? What happens? Do they stop coming? Do they stop uh, loving the team again as it was formerly, many years ago, really? But that is the big thing that I would be worried about if I were Michael Bidwill. I think one of the realities, too, look, I, I think, and, and this is what makes me believe the Cardinals will try older school approaches with Kyler Murray before they would cry uncle and pay him anything close to what he wants. I think that they, I don't know this, but I think that they were behind some of the narratives that came out after the season. The story about Bidwell being furious with Cliff Kingsbury, and he kind of was hanging by a thread for a little while before he got an extension. That did not sit well with Eric Burkhardt, who represents both Kingsbury and Murray. And I think that if the Cardinals had fired Cliff Kingsbury, they would have had a definite issue with Kyler Murray, who would have wanted out if Kingsbury had been fired. So so Burkhart leverages Murray's presence on the team to get Kingsbury an extension, not even a lame duck, let's see what you do in 2022 before we decide whether you're our guy long term. He gets him an extension, and now Burkhart is stirring up this stuff with Kyler. I could see Michael Bidwell being frustrated by that because, like, hey, we gave your guy – the head coach, a new contract with the anticipation that Kyler would stay. And then the stuff that came out about Kyler Murray 
the whole idea that he's self-centered and finger-pointing and immature, I think that was a manifestation of the team's frustration and effort, clumsy or otherwise, to try to knock down his expectations a little bit before time to negotiate. That didn't work either. That's just what makes me think that the Cardinals may not view this the way that other teams would. The Cardinals may have a different mindset, and there may be a stubbornness there. And Kyler Murray may have to hold out. And one of the realities of his contract and I got a copy of it last night to make sure this was accurate he's due to make 5.5 million this year but 4.524 million of it comes in the form of a roster bonus that is only paid if he's in camp on the third day of the process if he's not there by day three that 4.5 million goes away forever yeah he'll make more money down the road but that 4.5 million does not get paid so it's not a matter of the fines that he would Oh, 40,000 a day. That can be waived. But if he's not there, third day of camp, 4.5 million gone for good. Which means if he's not there third day of camp, Peter, he may not be coming at all. He may say, no, I'm not playing in 2022. Now he'd also owe 5.8 million back in unearned signing bonus money. But that's when we would know this is real. If he doesn't show up day one and isn't back by day three, this is real. And he seriously is considering doing something other than playing football in 2022. And as we've said before, he's the one guy in the NFL right now who could go get a baseball glove and jump into the Oakland A's organization at some level. Obviously not at the highest level, but if he wanted to do something to occupy his time, and he said time and again he'd love to play baseball, he'd love to play both, he can just go play baseball until this is all figured out. Mike, you know, what happens with clauses like that, and of course it's a legitimate clause, I, did not, I didn't know until you just said that, I didn't know how the 5.5 uh, was going to be paid out this year. But that is illuminating. At the end of the day, though, in my opinion, it's not that illuminating. It's illuminating as a factoid for today and, and where his state of mind would be if he did indeed not show up in camp by day three. But at the end of the day, teams pay that stuff back. They always do. They always will account for that in whatever future deal they would do with a player. So in my opinion, I think when you look at where Kyler Murray is right now, all right, I don't believe he's playing this year for 5.5 million. I've said it, said it six weeks ago. But the issue is, the issue is, how exactly does this get resolved? I don't think the Cardinals are one of these teams that says, we're going to write you a check now for, you know, 55 million on a signing bonus to lock you up for the next X number of years. That's just not how they do business. My feeling is this is done with guaranteed money year by year by year that, that will allow Kyler Murray to get on the fringe of what the great quarterbacks are making right now. Those are the biggest things that, in my opinion, will be done to get this contract done at the end of the day. And look... I believe after a lot of huffing and puffing and all this stuff that Kyler Murray will go back to the Cardinals and there will be a new contract of some sort, you know, by the start of this season. But I do think there's going to be a lot of choppy waters before that. Well, it all comes back to where you peg Kyler Murray's value. We said this a few weeks ago. Four or five years back, the next guy up for a contract became the highest paid player in NFL history by a little bit more than the last guy. Derek Carr, who got an extension this week, was one of those. It started with Andrew Luck, then it went to Derek Carr, Jimmy Garoppolo, Kirk Cousins, Matthew Stafford, Matt Ryan. It was one after another after another. Now, look at this spread. Look at that. From 1 to 10. You've got $20 million there. How do you resolve where Kyler Murray lands on that range when you also accept the fact that the cap is going to continue to go up and up and up? See, that's what I can't 
reconcile here. Time is on Kyler Murray's side, but he's run out of patience. He wants his deal now, even though the more time passes, the more he's going to get. And I think Eric Burkhart wants both. Eric Burkhart wants a deal now that takes into account where the puck is going. That's what's going to make it even harder. So I said earlier, maybe the Cardinals are in the 30 to $35 million range and Burkhart's in 45 to 50. Hell, for all I know, Burkhart's in 55 to 60 because he's thinking, number one, franchise quarterbacks are always the most valuable player on the field and should be paid accordingly. And number two, the cap keeps going up. So if I'm going to commit for four or five years, that deal needs to take into account where the cap is going to be. Here's my projection, Mr. Bidwell, of where the cap is going to be. And the percentage that you're paying, my client is going to get smaller and smaller because the cap is going to mushroom. So we need to take this into account. That's why I've been a proponent for years, Peter, of locking in a fixed percentage of compensation for the quarterback. So they know, they have certainty as to how much of the cap is going to go to him and how much of the cap they're going to have left for everybody else. This would be an ideal spot to do that. Not that anyone's going to do it. I'm not even sure that anybody even tries to do it anymore. Although maybe Deshaun Watson could have gotten it in Cleveland. But I think that's the problem. You're going to have a fundamental disagreement of Kyler Murray's value. And that's what could keep this thing from resolving the way that it should. You know what's funny about contracts in the NFL? I'm writing about this for Monday. It's funny that today, in today's football, the last few contracts, if you take them on average per year and not necessarily what this single year is, if you look at that and if you give Aaron Rodgers you know, if you assign him a value of 50 million or 50.3 million, whatever it is, that is a much bigger percentage of the salary cap than uh, it was 10 years ago. Let's say, I think 10 years ago, Dwight Freeney was the biggest per year average at 19 million. And what is happening right now, Mike, is that I, the way I look at it, the agents have done a very good job of saying, okay, we're going to play hopscotch with these contracts. But look at it, Mike. The only position that the hopscotch is going as crazy as quarterbacks is wide receiver. Is it happening the same at tight end? No. Is it happening the same at tackle? No. Is it happening the same even at edge rusher? Not exactly, some, but certainly not exactly. And I think what is so interesting to look at now is that if you're Eric Burkhart, what do you argue? If I'm Eric Burkhart, I'm only arguing for one thing, short-term deal. Because I know the Cardinals are not giving me Aaron Rodgers money. They're probably not giving me Deshaun Watson money or Patrick Mahomes money. I will settle for $40 million a year for the next three years with some guarantees built in. And just because I want to get another bite at the apple in 2025. That's when the Kyler Murray playing style becomes a real issue. Now, look, we know how these quarterbacks or these contracts, excuse me, go five, six years. It's after two or three that the team's able to tear it up and move on anyway. So if that's the case, why not do a short-term deal? But the unique challenge in handling Kyler Murray's career is, given his size, given that one of his most important attributes is his incredible speed and agility, you know, this isn't a guy who's going to be playing when he's 44, this isn't a guy who's going to have full tread on the tire and be able to zip around like we saw in the clips we were showing earlier. This is going to become the guy who's more like he was in the playoff loss to the Rams, where the mobility wasn't there. I think he had two carries for six yards in the whole game. He didn't have that same punch. You take that out of his game, it's not good enough for the NFL. So, so this is the ultimate, because at the other position, this is true. Get what you can while you can, because you may not be able to get it for very long. Kyler Murray is the ultimate example of a quarterback who better get what he can while he can 
because there's no guarantee he's going to be able to get it for very long. He's not going to be playing deep into his 30s, more likely than not, which raises the stakes on this contract. And look, I'm sure Eric Burkhardt has a plan, but the Cardinals have a plan too. And that's where this thing is going to get very interesting. And I don't believe in accidents or coincidences, especially when you're talking about deals like this. The fact that this is all coming up now with now 13 days to go until the draft is not an accident or a coincidence. This is, I want to know what you're going to pay my guy because if you're not going to pay him, I want to find someone who will. Yeah, I just don't think the Cardinals are going to do that. Um, I don't see it. And honestly, maybe, maybe the Carolina Panthers would move heaven and earth to try to get him. If if David Tepper picks up the phone today, or probably would have done it yesterday, and calls Scott Fitterer as general manager or Matt Rule and says, get on this right now, I want to find out if there's any way we can get Kyler Murray. Then, you know, then and only then would I think that there was a possibility that, that this could happen. Because right now, I just... I don't think it's a possibility. I just don't see uh, the Cardinals moving him in the next two weeks. I, I would agree with you. If I had to pick one or the other, I would say he's not going to be traded just because the Cardinals are not wired to go along with this new yeah. trend where, and we talked about this after Tyree Kill. You have to have one team that says F them picks and another team that says, I'll take it. I'll gladly shed the obligation to pay this guy a ton of money and I'll reload my roster with everything you're going to give up for him. And you have to have each side of that equation in order to make it work. And that's the other side of this too that we have to take into account. Let's say the Cardinals will trade him. And let's say that there are teams interested. What do you offer for Kyler Murray? Because... Number one, you're going to have to pay him a contract above and beyond what the Cardinals are willing to do. And you have to make the Cardinals happy as well. That's what's so stunning about like the Tyreek Hill deal. They make him one of the highest paid players in receiver, the Dolphins do, or one of the highest paid receivers in football, excuse me. And they give him, and they give the Chiefs five picks. That the Chiefs, it was enough to get the Chiefs say, fine, we'll do this deal. I, I just don't know that you find a team even if the Cardinals are willing to do it, they put enough on the table to get the Cardinals to say, I'll take it, and enough on the table financially to get Eric Burkhardt to say, that's where we want to play. See, that that's yeah, it's, it's almost like, Peter, the Cardinals' best move here, their checkmate move could be to say to Eric Burkhardt, go ahead, go ahead, try to find someone. Do what the Chiefs did with Drew Rosenhaus. Go ahead, start texting General managers, see if you can find somebody who will give us what we want and we'll give you what you want. Sometimes getting a chance to see what else is out there for a player who wants a lot is the best way to get the player's expectations to come down. It's not a bad idea because what the what Kansas City did with Drew Rosenhaus, you know what, I don't think we've talked enough about how amazing what happened with Tyreek Hill and Kansas City and Miami is. That was absolutely amazing. And here's why it was amazing, okay? And why, you know, the uh, Kyler Murray thing is not starting out the way this thing did. Basically, Brett Veach, the GM of the Chiefs, told Drew Rosenhaus, you can go out and see who might be interested in him. But you cannot talk about exact figures. You can give him, you can give teams the parameters of what you're talking about. And the parameters of what they were talking about, in essence, is Devontae Adams. You know, somewhere right in there. But you couldn't, he couldn't be specific. And so Rosenhaus could call up teams and he found 12 that were interested and two financially and uh, and in compensation terms that would play ball with Kansas City. And throughout this whole thing, Mike, 
here's what's so amazing about this. This trade got done on, I think it got agreed to late on a Tuesday night or early on a Wednesday, something like that. But on Tuesday morning, Kansas City with Andy Reid and Brett Veach are still talking to Tyreek Hill and to Drew Rosenhaus and basically saying, here's an offer, which was a lot more than Rosenhaus and Hill thought that it would be. But there were other things at play. I think Tyreek Hill really wanted to go to Miami. And honestly, Kansas City, I think, although they said, oh my gosh, we're, we're so sad about losing Hill, which they are. They're sad about losing him. But for five draft choices and for the financial flexibility of having that, whatever the realistic uh, money is, per year to be able to spend on other positions. You know, I think Kansas City is very happy they made the deal. The player is very happy to be in Miami. Miami's happy. I've never seen a situation where a star goes from one team to another and everyone is euphoric about it. It's just, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. That I have a feeling that's not going to happen with Kyler Murray. Oh. Well, and the most amazing aspect of it is that it was kept so tightly under wraps at a time when people are yeah. crawling over every nook and cranny of the NFL landscape for any news that they can find. Somehow, some way, 31 teams respected the request from Drew Rosenhaus to not say anything. That's amazing. That's amazing that not a single general manager is, or yeah. anyone else in an organization who knew about it blabbed to anyone. That's an easy favor to trade. You got somebody out there that covers your team, that covers the NFL, that you you don't want them, you know, maybe suggesting you're not doing your job very well or maybe you shouldn't have your job. That's part of the quid pro quo that happens. It's sometimes subtle. It's sometimes not subtle. Hey, I got one for you. I got one. For hey, hey, guy who would be inclined to say bad things about me when I screw up. I got something for you to maybe get you to not do it the next time you're inclined to do so. You may want to look around whether or not Tyreek Hill's getting traded. What? Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing that no one breathed a word yeah. of it. So that ain't happening with Kyler Murray because we're all on notice now that. Something could go down, and if there are any Kyler Murray talks, if they would give Eric Burkhardt permission to do what Drew Rosenhaus did, that's not staying quiet. And the Cardinals would have to know that going in. But it could be. I mean, that that is the boss move if you're the Cardinals. Hey, you don't like what you think we would pay you? Now, they haven't made the offer yet. But, hey, go ahead. See what's out there. See what you could get from somebody who would also have to give us three first-round picks or whatever the Deshaun Watson package is. We would want the Deshaun Watson package minimum for Kyler Murray. Plus, you got to figure out what they're going to pay your guy. Good luck finding someone who will do that because he's not going to find it. And uh, maybe that's part of what Kyler Murray needs to work through. That's what Burkhart needs to work through. The idea that, that – and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Burkhart already has an ace in the hole that he's been secretly talking to because we know that happens as well. I just would be surprised if it comes to that. I think Murray wants to stay in Arizona, and he's trying to apply some pressure to them to do something that they don't want to do, and we'll see what they do and when they do it. But as I said at the top, they've made it clear to him they're going to take care of him this summer. My concern is their version of taking care of him, Peter, is going to be a far cry. It's going to be closer to the bottom of that range we showed earlier, that $20 million gap yeah. from top of the market to, to the – to the 10th highest paid quarterback. Cardinals are going to be down near 9 or 10. Burkhart's maybe going to be beyond one at this point. I, I bet I'll, they I'll won't be to... down at 9 or 10. They'll be realistic enough to know that they can't be down at 9 or 10. Because, you know, any you, you could take the guys at 9 or 10. I think Kirk Cousins was 9 or, or maybe 8. But, but, but I, what you're saying is right. I think he would be, I think their offer at the end of the day would be somewhere in the middle of that. Maybe a little bit below 40, but not a lot below 40. Because otherwise, why would Eric Burkhardt even consider it? They've told me that we need to take a break, but I just thought of something that I think is relevant here. 
What's the other big quarterback contract conundrum in the NFL right now? It's Lamar Jackson. And the issue there is the player won't engage. The issue with Murray is the team won't engage. At what point is Murray better off? And I know he's not going to play for $5.5 million this year, but, you know, Lamar Jackson played for like $2 million last year. And uh, he, he's, and he's into his fifth year. Right, right. But he's into his fifth year option. And, and the Cardinals are yeah. surely going to pick up the fifth-year option for Kyler Murray. Um, I, my, my point is, if you really want out of Arizona, you got three years in. And I know four years is a long time as the NFL goes, but Kyler Murray could do what Lamar Jackson is apparently doing, which is just going one year at a time and waiting for the opportunity to hit the open market. That's the only explanation that currently makes sense in Baltimore – Kyler Murray could do that. He could do the Kirk Cousins thing if he wanted to. Now, it gets back to wear and tear and his unique skill set and when does he start losing some of that speed. But if he wanted to go seven years and out, he could do it, Peter. I just can't see it with that body type. I I just, behind that offensive line, it's just, I mean, yes, in an, you know, in in one world that makes a lot of sense. In Kyler Murray's world, in my opinion, it makes no sense because well, you see, don't know if after you don't know what kind of physical condition you're going to be in in five years. It do, it doesn't make sense for Lamar Jackson either, though. That's what's so wild about it. Of, of all the quarterbacks in the NFL, the two guys that that approach doesn't make sense for is Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray. Yeah, but Lamar Jackson's yeah. doing it, apparently. We don't know what he's doing. He's apparently doing that, but who knows? Who knows? Because he's <laughs> tweeted, oh, I'm not trying to get out of Baltimore, where you're not acting like you're trying to stay in Baltimore. That's for damn sure. But Kyler Murray's also in that same spot where will he still be able to do it four seasons from now? It's, it's, and, and the fact that Murray... See, this is, the, this is the fundamental problem, and then we do have to take a break. The fact that Murray wants to get paid so so fervently now because of the fact that he's been banged up, that he's not big. I assume that's why they want to do it. There's an urgency there. That's the thing that should give the Cardinals hesitation to take on $200 million in injury risk. You're trying to push the injury risk from Murray to the team. Well, the team doesn't want it either because this isn't the usual quarterback situation where you could be Tom Brady and play until you're 44. You're in the pocket. You're protected by all the rules that apply when you're in the pocket. Once you leave the pocket and cross the line of scrimmage, you're a running back. And we saw, well, even though Kyler Murray, uh, the irony is he got injured behind the line. He didn't get injured while he was running the ball, but still this is not your usual quarterback that you can say, we don't have to worry about him getting injured. You do have to worry about him getting injured. And, Burkhart seems to be worried about that, and Kyler's worried about that. Well, the team's worried about it, too, and they don't want to take on that gigantic liability in the event that he does get injured and he doesn't play as well as he used to. Look, the bottom line in this whole thing is that it looks like the Cardinals don't want to do anything right now, and I would be very surprised if they gave Eric Burkhart Uh, permission to talk to teams a la Drew Rosenhaus, Tyreek Hill. I think we are headed for a July 25th showdown between the Arizona Cardinals and Kyler Murray and the agent Eric Burkhart. I will be surprised if this gets done before Kyler Murray and the Cardinals are staring over the cliff to see what life without the other is really like. And as those of us who cover the NFL would say, uh, no complaints to have something meaty like this that is a real controversy that really does have an impasse buried within it and who knows how it's going to play out. It's a reason to keep paying attention to your various news sources throughout the coming weeks and months, even after the draft, when you think things are going to slow down, at least between Kyler Murray and the Cardinals, they quite possibly won't. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.